still tracing our family roots? Yeah. Just look for the Dust Bowl elbows. We have those? Oh, yeah. But Jurgen's Original Cherry Almond Lotion keeps away the elbow drought. Smell it. I love it. This one had a lot of husbands. And try Energizing Citrus Body Butter. Jurgen's. Okay, guys, here is your dose of cuteness for today. Yeah, check it out as my Zoom with Jeff Goldblum and Bernadette Peters turns into a total... Happening now. An east side home overtaken by flames and smoke. What we know coming up. A north side woman shoots and kills her ex-boyfriend. San Antonio police say that the incident is the culmination of an abusive relationship. I'm Devin Clark, and coming up, we'll tell you what neighbors have to say. As new COVID-19 cases began to surge in the state of Texas last month, two state representatives reached out to the governor. Their questions went unanswered. Why they're accusing him of putting the economy before science. It's more dangerous now than it was when we first closed. Teachers staging a sit-in at the state capitol asking for a safer way to open Texas schools. And sure, we're feeling the heat outside again today, but temperatures are actually scaling back just a little bit. I'll be back with your full forecast, which does include a little slight chance of rain coming right now. Plus, the future of the high school 2020 football season very much up in the air. Greg Simmons has the latest. The news at five starts right now. San Antonio firefighters spending another hot afternoon battling flames at a home on the city's east side where one person was still inside. Yeah, you could see the smoke for miles. It was happening on Virginia Boulevard near South New Braunfels. The home now considered a total loss. Stephen Cavazos live from the scene now. Stephen, what can you tell us about the person that was inside? Steve Eces, thankfully that person was able to get out of the burning home inside, but we're told they were taken to a nearby hospital with severe burns injuries to their legs and their feet. But just take a look at this house right now. This is what's left after that fire from earlier today. Fire crews are still out here overhauling some hot spots and they plan to be out here for the next few hours, they tell us. Now they say they arrived to find an aggressive fire, but because of that high heat, close to 20 engines were called out for additional support. Now, crews were able to contain that fire to just this home, but they say it was not easy, especially with the homes in this neighborhood being older. These older homes are built extremely well. They're built extremely tight, so they're very, very difficult to, to get water in there, especially when you're going defensive. Now, we're told that the person who was inside was actually trying to rescue a few pets. It's not clear how many pets were inside, but a cat was found near the home. Now, it's still too early to determine a cause of this fire or if, to determine the estimate of this damage. But we are told that fire crews, again, are going to be out here for some time overhauling these hotspots. An investigation is expected to continue sometime later. Reporting live on the city's east side, Stephen Cavazos, KSAT 12 News. Steve. Thank you, Stephen. Neighbors in a north side community say they are relieved that a woman is safe after police say she was forced to shoot and kill her abusive ex-boyfriend. As Devin Clark explains, victims advocates say the woman followed all the right steps to protect herself. It's the latest story in our Loving in Fear series, Confronting Domestic Violence. Something like this has happened in our neighborhood. Emotions are on high after bullets rang out in this north side neighborhood on Shadow Cliff yesterday. Uh, I became very worried. But police say it wasn't the bad actor who pulled the trigger. They tell a 67-year-old Robert Wayne Lissy showed up to his ex-girlfriend's house, got in through a garage door said to be left open by maintenance, and threatened to kill her before she shot him at least four times, killing him in her bedroom. Neighbors who didn't want to be identified say they were stunned. It's heartbreaking. When, uh, when something like this happens and you have no idea that anything this dire is going on. San Antonio police say there was a history of abuse and that the woman had a protective order against Lissy before he showed up yesterday and tried to tie her up. We're also seeing a call history of threats made at this uh, location. And so things are lining up right now. Domestic violence victims abuse advocates say the woman took all the crucial steps to prove her case by documenting the alleged abuse before she was forced to take drastic measures. We always encourage survivors to seek protective orders, to press charges, to uh, tell the truth if they have to seek medical attention. For the investigation continues, but at this time, police say they do not anticipate any charges being brought against the shooter 
who they say is actually the victim in this case. Of course, we have resources for any victims experiencing domestic violence right now on KSAT.com. Reporting on the north side, Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. New at 5, we've learned the name of a man killed in a crash in Southeast Bear County Monday night. He's been identified as 23 year old Jacob Ramos Hernandez. The sheriff's office says Hernandez hit an SUV along I-35 near the Bear Atascosa County line and was thrown from his vehicle. He died at the scene. Several other vehicles were involved in that crash. No one else was hurt. That crash is still under investigation. The Texas Education Agency now allowing schools to stay closed this fall without risking state education funding. Last week, the TEA said districts needed to reopen for in-person learning and would have only three weeks to transition from remote learning to in-person. That's not the case now, though. The TEA says districts can decide to stay closed as long as remote instruction is offered to all students. The decision comes on the same day teachers from across the state organized a sit-in a sit-in protest at the state capitol. Been making decisions as it goes, but I think the teachers and the students were starting to get stressed because like, it's more dangerous now than it was when we first closed. Several area school districts are still determining guidelines for reopening. You can read more about that and see their tentative start dates right now on our website, ksat.com. The state of Texas reporting more than 10,700 new cases of COVID-19 today. That brings the state's total case count to more than 282,000 since the start of the pandemic. These record high daily reportings have been a trend that we've seen over the last few weeks. As cases began to surge in Texas last month, San Antonio State Representatives questioned and criticized Governor Greg Abbott's response to the pandemic. As the Defenders Dylan Collier reports, much of their correspondence sent directly to the governor and his staff and came weeks before Abbott mandated wearing masks in public. June 7th, on a day fewer than 1,500 new cases of COVID-19 were reported in Texas, State Representative Diego Bernal's communications director submitted a question to Governor Greg Abbott asking what the threshold was for another stay-at-home order. The next day, during the governor's weekly call with members of the Texas legislature, Bernal's question went unanswered. He said it's part of a pattern in which inquiries submitted to the governor ahead of time don't come up during these one-way calls. Especially if they were challenging questions or questions that maybe put science uh, ahead of the economy. Ten days later, as new COVID cases climbed over 3,000 in a single day, Bernal's staff again reached out to the governor's office and asked if Abbott was reconsidering the state's reopening strategy. And again, according to Bernal, the question was not covered during the call. We couldn't ask questions. We were just there to listen. Bernal was not the only San Antonio rep pushing for Abbott to go back to the drawing board. In a scathing letter sent directly to the governor June 30th, Representative Trey Martinez Fisher told Abbott he took a gamble on the state's response and lost, noting that Abbott had yet to respond to his inquiries and concerns and that moving forward, he needed to grant members of the Texas House the courtesy of a reply. Two days later, the governor put his mask order in place. For the Defenders, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. When asked directly about state lawmakers being muted, a spokesman for Governor Greg Abbott tells the defenders there has often been a time crunch during these calls and that the governor's priority is to get the information out. Well, it was a busy election night here in Bear County. One race we are still keeping an eye on is the race for District 23. Only seven votes separate Tony Gonzalez from Raul Reyes. With some absentee ballots still not counted, that race is still too close to call. Yeah, you heard that right. Seven votes. The seat became available when Congressman Will Hurd announced he will not run again. Both Hurd and President Trump endorsed Gonzalez. The Republican winner will face Democratic nominee Gina Ortiz Jones in November. The United States set yet another single day record for new coronavirus infections. But in recent speeches, President Trump is zeroing in on his 2020 rival, Joe Biden. And Karen Kaifa is at the White House to explain the political jabs between the presidential candidates. 
President Trump sharpening his attacks on Joe Biden, Joe calling Biden. out the presumptive Democratic presidential nominee any chance he gets. Joe Biden, sleepy Joe Biden. Whether it's a law enforcement uh, briefing inside the Oval Office. Biden and the radical left want to open borders for MS-13 and others. We want strong borders. Or a rally-style speech in the Rose Garden. Now Joe Biden is pushing a platform that would demolish the U.S. economy. The president and his re-election campaign ramping up efforts. And Joe Biden stands with them, cutting police funding. Yes. To knock down the That's former vice president. Eliminate. We could go on for days. The increased attention comes as national surveys show Biden leading President Trump by double digits. Democrats pouncing on the poll numbers, running ads in swing states won by Trump in 2016, like Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Florida. I'm thinking of all of you today across the state of Florida. The Biden campaign also on the offense, attempting to make red states like Georgia and Texas. This virus is tough, but Texas is tougher. More competitive come November. When you look at the legacy that the Obama-Biden administration has in Georgia, people remember that. President Trump spending time and money in the Peach State to shore up an appeal towards his base. I'm not going to talk about 2016. That was the greatest election, and now we have to do something very important. We have to keep it going, or this country will be in big, big trouble. But as the coronavirus crisis continues to rage in the United States, the political playbook that helped make Trump president may have to change if he wants a shot at a second term. At the White House, I'm Karen Kaifa. But it was the knee of the entire Minneapolis Police Department on the neck of George Floyd that killed him. An update now on the death of George Floyd. The attorney for the Floyd family has filed a federal civil rights lawsuit against the city of Minneapolis and the police officers involved. Floyd died May 25th after one officer pinned his neck to the ground using his knee for almost nine minutes. The lawsuit outlines critical issues with police training and the city's knowledge of cultural racism and bad behavior. Today marked our ninth 100 degree day so far this year. At 101 the high temperature, that's at least at this point. But we'll get an official update by 6 o'clock. There's still a little bit of time to warm up. But so far, 101 the high, and that would be one degree shy of the record. But it's not out of the realm of possibilities that we could still hit that record for today. Del Rio, Warren's Backyard, 105, 100 Panamaria, 96, 96 in Lakey, and right now 100 in Bulverde. We're all feeling the heat. Many locations in the triple digits. You take a look at Bandera, it's 101. We have a lot to talk about. Weather headlines, space station flyover later on tonight, Comet Neowise, and even a slight chance of rain. We'll cover it all coming right up. All right, thank you, Adam. With the scorching summer heat upon us, Gonzaba Medical Group doing its part to help seniors stay cool. This morning, they gave away dozens of free fans at the Woodlawn location. They're going to be holding two more fan drives on July 22nd and July 29th. According to their Facebook page, the one scheduled for next week is at the Gonzaba Event Center on Pleasanton Road, and that's a first come first serve basis. The San Antonio Food Bank receiving a $15,000 donation from Papa John's today. The Feed Your Family, Feed Your Community program launched in April. It included a $3 donation on every order using a special promo code. For every dollar donated, the food bank is able to provide seven meals to those in need. Happening tomorrow, the Salvation Army of San Antonio hosting a drive through public food distribution. It's at the Peacock Boys and Girls Club by Woodlawn Lake Park from 9 in the morning until noon. It's also a first come, first serve. They're anticipating a huge turnout, so bring water and snacks and be prepared for the possibility of a long wait. Well, from cloth masks to handkerchiefs and everything in between when it comes to choosing the right mask, which type offers the most protection for those around you? The answer might surprise you. We'll explain coming up next. We've been told by hospital and city and county officials that they may be needed. Now, apparently, they are in place. This is new video coming into our KSAT 12 newsroom of refrigerated trailers arriving in San Antonio 
for one purpose. The city says with the growing number of COVID related deaths happening in our community and funerals on hold, hospitals experiencing a backlog of deceased patients. These trucks will be used to store those bodies till they're released to funeral homes. The city did not say which hospitals are set to begin using them yet. Health experts and government officials alike are pushing the importance of wearing face masks to help stop the spread of coronavirus. But with so many different mask types out there, you may be wondering which ones are going to protect you and others the best. The answer may surprise you. According to a study at Florida Atlantic University, well-fitted masks made from two layers of tightly stitched cotton fabric are the best when it comes to blocking the droplets from coughs. Researchers compared the effectiveness of these masks with three other styles of face coverings, loosely folded cloth masks, bandana style coverings, and cone style masks. Using a mannequin head, a manual pump, a smoke generator, and a laser, researchers were able to emulate a person's sneezing or coughing and then trace how far the droplets traveled. With a two layer stitch cloth mask, the potential virus droplets only traveled two and a half inches from the wearer. The second most effective was the cone style mask, with droplets going approximately eight inches out from the mask. The folded handkerchief and bandana styles proved least effective, with leakage expanding from one to three feet. If someone with no face covering coughs or sneezes, those droplets can travel up to eight feet around them. And a reminder from health experts when choosing a mask, N95 masks should be reserved for health care workers. And now even those can be troublesome in some cases. Right now on KSAT.com, you can read about how Southwest Research Institute is testing masks for hospitals to ensure the safety of their workers. All right, it is still warm out. Mm -hmm. I know it's not as warm, but it's still warm. Hey, from 107 to 105 to so far today, 101. It's the trend we're looking at. Yes. It's the trend. I like this trend. It's still hot outside though, no matter uh, which way you cut it. All right, we do have a space station flyover later on tonight that will be visible very nicely in our clear sky. 9.44 p.m., look to the west-southwest. It's gonna last only six minutes, okay? Low on the horizon to the west-southwest at 9.44 p.m. It's gonna to get to a maximum height of about 42 degrees and disappear to the north northeast. So just set your alarm for 943 or 942 and you'll catch it in the last six minutes. Looks like a really bright light just scooting across the sky. So enjoy that later on this evening. Now, speaking of outer space, we fielded some questions about Comet Neowise and it's not easy to see, but if you do find an area outside the city lights away from light pollution, one hour after sunset, so that would be a little before or right around that space station time. Look to the northwest and very low to the horizon. If you know exactly where you're looking, you might be able to briefly spot that comet. It's a dim comet. Usually you need the aid of binoculars or a telescope to really help you out. But if you're far enough away from city lights and light pollution, you can see it with the naked eye. It's just not the easiest comet to see. Right now it's pretty low on the horizon, but in the coming days it gets higher. However, the caveat is that it gets dimmer in the coming days. If you can see the Big Dipper, the big scoop of it, go down about three fifths, and that's where you should look, okay? Again, that's an hour after sunset to the northwest. 101 here today, Hondo 101, Del Rio 105. That's an improvement upon the past couple of days. Catula 105 for the high temperature, and those are pretty much our current readings. Actually, an update, Del Rio now at 106. It's still that time of day where we can tack on another degree on our air temperature and Gonzales is an even 100. A little higher humidity this afternoon. That's one of the differences and one of the reasons why the temperatures didn't spike up as high as the past couple of days. But of course the offset is heat index. So it feels like 103 in San Antonio. Uh, feels like 108 in Del Rio and feels like 105 in Laredo right now. By the way, we do have some Saharan dust overhead. It's just very light amounts, but we are expecting this thicker plume to make it here by Friday, Saturday. So something to keep in mind. Otherwise, the overall weather pattern is still the big blue H over Texas. Some parts of North Texas lucky enough to get a few little showers, but notice this activity over the panhandle of Florida and the Gulf Coastline here. That's some good rainfall. It's a nice little disturbance they have. That nice little disturbance is going to head our way 
but likely pass just to the south of San Antonio and only give us a very slight chance of rain in the days ahead. I mean, we're talking a 20% chance at best, and that's mainly east of I-35. Clear sky this evening. Good for viewing that space station flyover at 944 PM. Humid tomorrow, 77 in the morning, back up to 100 for the high temperature. And really that 20% chance is our best hope, as uh, small it is, as it is. It's our best hope for any rainfall. But look at those temperatures, upper 90s, Friday through the weekend. Surprise. All mm -hmm. right, thanks so much, Adam. All right, there's a ripple effect that may be taking place, and it started last night in Austin. And I cannot say with certainty there's not going to be a 2020 right. high school football season, but I can believe I can say with certainty this, it's going to be delayed to start. When we come back, high school football outlook looking more and more bleak as we go along. The Justin Rockets looks like they're out at least their first two games. And Dak's deadline has come and gone as we have a new contract coming up. The dominoes are starting to fall. The likelihood of having a high school football season in the fall during the COVID-19 pandemic is looking bleaker and bleaker. And when you told you first on the night be last night, the Austin Travis Interim Health Authority, Dr. Mark Escott, has ordered all school districts and private schools in the county to delay reopening on campus instruction until after September the 7th. It includes no extracurricular activities, including sports, until students are allowed to return to campus, meaning it wipes out the first two weeks of their high school football season in the Austin area. That will affect the Judson Rockets, who are set to renew their rivalry with Lake Travis on September the 4th in Converse. But Rockets head coach Roddy Williams reveals that's not the only game that has been lost due to the coronavirus. We have Lake Travis week two, and um, I was talking to Coach Carter last night when he came out. So it's looking like that that probably game that game probably won't happen. Uh, I talked to Claude Mathis up in DeSoto a couple weeks ago, and we were already kind of planning maybe for not being able to play just from everything that's going on. So. As of right now, it's kind of a wait and see and, and uh, try to figure some things out from there. And that means the Rockets will be without their first two games of the season. Odago County has taken a step further as their local health authority has ordered all schools, both public and private, not to before September the 27th. And at such, no extracurricular activities, including high school football, can take place. The San Antonio School District has not allowed summer strength and conditioning camps to resume. And Round Rock ISD has just shut down their camps. Pro Football Coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The deadline has come and gone, and no new long-term contract extension for Cowboy star quarterback Dak Prescott. Today was a deadline at three, but no great surprise. After Dak signed his franchise tag, they were paying $31.4 million this season. And even if the Cowboys tag him again next year, when he becomes a free agent, Dak can still make the neighborhood of $69 million over the next two years and still sign an extension down the road. As the Spurs wrap up their sixth day in the NBA bubble in Orlando, Spurs head coach Greg Popovich has called Patty Mills the spiritual leader of the team. What does that mean? The one of only two players left over from the 2014 NBA championship team. You know, and that is a big part, well, part of the reason why I've been here for so long is, is all of the stuff I've been able to learn um, from him um, that doesn't necessarily relate to basketball. It relates to everyday stuff, and, and that has helped me tremendously in my uh, in my growth, in my development, as my upbringing, I guess, as as an adult. Here for more of the Spurs tonight on the Night Beat. Thank you, Greg. You got it. We'll be right back. Thanks for watching the news at five. World News up next. We'll see you back here at six.